Hello, welcome to Confessions of a Frustrated Game Master. I am Robert the Narrator, and thank you for joining me for another episode of Confessions. This is episode number 22, and it will be another episode in my series of top 10 favorite RPGs of all time. Episode 21 was also a top 10 episode, and I think I'm going to get a few of these out of the way. I think the series has been moving a little too slow, so I want to get some of these out of the way and complete the series. So that's what I'm going to do. We're going to go ahead and knock out another one of my top 10 favorite RPGs of all time. So this will be game number six on my list, and that game is Numenera by Monty Cook Games. Numenera was released in 2013. Monty Cook is a well-known Dungeons and Dragons game designer. He worked on third edition. He worked briefly on fifth edition. He worked on Alternity for Wizards of the Coast. He did his own Dungeons and Dragons setting, Tolis, and he's just done a, a ton of work in the industry and is, is very well regarded and has uh, released a really great game here that I've been playing for a little while now. What drew me to Numenera? Well, I think I came across the fact that Monty Cook was doing a Kickstarter for Numenera on a podcast that I was listening to. And I went over to check it out and I was very impressed by what I saw. I went ahead and downloaded the beta test and ran it for a couple of friends and the, the setting was refreshing, the rules were really awesome, and the game was very unique. What, what Monty Cook put together was unlike anything I had uh, ever seen before. And uh, you hear that a lot with my top 10 favorite RPGs of all time. So it may give you a little bit of a hint that I really like new experiences. I, I can't say that for everyone that I've ever gamed with, but if you want to uh, win me over, if it's something that I haven't seen or experienced before, that's a plus to me at least. I was drawn to it because it, I, I checked out the Kickstarter. I want, I didn't kickstart Numenera. I purchased it after it came out, but I really did love it when I did uh, the playtest. That was really fun. What is Numenera all about? I think I'm going to read from the introduction of Numenera. It gives you a great understanding. There have been eight previous worlds. You may refer to them as ages, eons, epochs or eras, but it's not wrong to think of each as its own individual world. Each formal world stretched across the vast millennia of time. Each played host to a race whose civilizations rose to supremacy but eventually died or scattered, disappeared or transcended. During the time that each world flourished, those that ruled it spoke to the stars, re-engineered their physical bodies, and mastered form and essence, all in its own unique way. Each left behind remnants. The ninth world is built on the bones of the previous eight, and in particular, the last four. Reach into the dust, and you'll find that each particle has been worked, manufactured, or grown, and then ground back into drit, a fine, artificial soil, by the relentless power of time. Look to the horizon. Is that a mountain or part of an impossible monument to the forgotten emperor of a lost people? Feel that subtle vibration beneath your feet and know that ancient engines, vast machines the size of kingdoms, still operate in the bowels of the earth. The ninth world is about discovering the wonders of the worlds that came before it, not for their own sake, but as a means to improve the present and build a future. Each of the prior eight worlds, in its own way, is too distant, too different, too incomprehensible. Life today is too dangerous to dwell on a past that cannot be understood. The people excavate and study the marvels of the previous epochs just enough to help them survive in the world that they have been given. They know that energies and knowledge are suspended invisibly in the air. 
that reshaped continents of iron and glass below upon and above the earth hold vast treasures and that secret doorways to stars and other dimensions and realms provide power and secrets and death they sometimes call it magic and who are we to say that they're wrong more often however when they find leftovers of the old worlds the devices the vast machine complexes and altered landscapes the changes wrought upon living creatures by ancient energies, the invisible nano spirits hovering in the air in clouds called the iron wind, the information transmitted into the so-called data sphere, and the remnants of visitors from other dimensions and alien planets. They call these things the Numenera. That is what Numenera is all about. The PCs will mostly play human beings uh, billions of years in the future. Somehow, uh, the human race has come back into existence. They are just trying to survive amongst the ruins of the previous eight civilizations. And what Monty Cook likes to say is that the ninth world, or his idea for this game, is actually based on a saying by Arthur C. Clarke. Telephone, tell me about Arthur C. Clarke. According to io9 Gizmodo, Arthur C. Clarke was a brilliant futurist and writer, but he is probably most widely known for the third of his famous three laws. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So that is really the main focus of new, what Numenera is about. Is about these humans who who are surrounded by technologies that to them appear to be magic because they're so advanced that they can't understand it so a lot of them it's magic what is the setting of Numenera as I mentioned previously it set several billion years in the future the setting is generally medieval uh, where there is uh, farming and riding animals. Some communities uh, fashion swords or armor and carry shields. And then they go into the ruins of the Ninth World and find advanced technology, laser rifles, force field generators, all sorts of weird technologies that some of them are cobbled together and a lot of the technology that folks find are not being used for the item's original purpose. You have a science fantasy uh, setting on earth where folks are trying just trying to survive and go out into the ruins to find Numenera and Numenera can be anything from uh, devices from the previous eight worlds or they can be creatures or beings from the previous eight worlds and this is what the world looks like you have major cities and small villages dotting the entire world some cities can take advantage of a high level of technology some smaller villages are still kind of living that medieval existence where they may have a few Numenera to help them with farming or sustenance or survival but for the most part the technology level is, is that medieval. Now with the setting of Numenera because it takes place several billion years in the future a lot of people have trouble visualizing a world that is billions of years in the future. Since you're pretty much playing all humans, there are rules for making visitants or aliens, but for the most part, you're a human and somehow humans have repopulated the ninth world. It's hard for players to visualize what technology, what the world would be like a billion years from now. I mean, can you imagine showing a caveman a cell phone? You know, he would have no idea. Uh, he would have no concept of a cell phone or a computer. 
So one aspect of the setting is that Numenera is weird and Monty Cook wanted to make Numenera very weird and alien as far as the creatures that you come across and the landscapes and the environment because making the game weird would give players a feeling as though they really don't understand what is happening because the denizens of the world don't understand the world around them and they've actually come out with supplements that would assist a game master in injecting weird into the world to kind of simulate that several billion years in the future so they, they came out with a supplement where you could uh, it's called injecting the weird where you could roll on charts and if you were in a structure you could roll on this chart and the windows in the structure show what was happening outside exactly 14 and a half hours earlier or you can have uh, things weird about a town the waters of a fountain sometimes consume people sending them into another dimension or a small child glows with an eerie blue luminescence or a merchant sells seeds that grow into living buildings Monty Cook recommends that you describe but never explain you never tell someone what something is because the denizens of the world are constantly coming across items that they have no idea what it is so you should describe but never explain uh, what something actually is what are the mechanics of Numenera while discussing those I also wanted to talk how Numenera affected me as a player. I would have to say that in the last five years, Numenera, for two reasons, has been really an amazing experience. No other game has really hit my sweet spot as far as being a rules medium game like Numenera and the other reason that Numenera has been so important to me is that it really illustrated the huge gulf in understanding that existed between myself and my group and as a matter of fact Numenera was the game that said to me that if my group from what they say they want out of a game, if Numenera cannot satisfy my players based on what they tell me is important to them, then no system ever will. And the reason I, I say that is, and, that, and I'll talk about the mechanics of the game. So the mechanics of uh, Numenera are really, really easy. The core task resolution mechanic for Numenera is you have 10 levels of difficulty from one to ten. Whenever a player wants to do something, if they are acting against an uh, inanimate obstacle, say they want to knock down a door or climb a tree or jump from one rooftop to the other, the game master determines a level of difficulty. Let's say that a character wanted to force open a door and the game master says, hey, this door is, uh, is pretty sturdy so it would be kind of demanding so it would be difficulty three so the target number uh, for your action is three times the difficulty level so it's a difficulty three action so that need, that's a nine so what you do is you grab your d20 you roll it i rolled a 13 so you're equal to a higher than the target number you're successful that is if you are attempting to act against an obstacle which is not living. If you were attempting to act against an NPC, just like everything else in the world, NPCs have an NPC level from one to 10. So guess what? When you want to attack an NPC or when you want to dodge an NPC, 
you do it against that NPC's level. Same example, if you wanted to attack an NPC who had a level three, you would need a nine. You pick up your D20, you roll it. I have a uh, 17, so that is a hit. And that is the core task resolution mechanic for Numenera. My players, a lot of them are really uh, advocates of rules, light games. They are really advocates of the type of system that basically allows them to roll to hit, roll for damage, and pass the turn. They don't want to have to deal with a whole lot of maneuvers or tricks. They want to be able to roll the die and roll for damage and move on. Numenera, I thought, was the perfect system. You can play Numenera by picking up a die, uh, rolling a d20, and asking the Dungeon Master if you are successful. And that is what my player, at least what my players say they want out of a system. The reason I love Numenera so much is because if you're a rules light player and that's what you want to do and you want to stick to your guns, you can play Numenera by rolling the die and passing the turn. However, if you're a player like myself who likes a few more options and don't want every turn to be roll to hit, roll for damage, pass the turn, this is where it gets a little more interesting. There are ways that you can lower your difficulty numbers. Now, if you notice from my previous examples, at no point did I say you have to do so. You can do what's called spending effort. Part of the task resolution mechanic are the stats that the player characters have, and this is very unique. Numenera characters have three stats, might, speed, and intellect. Instead of those stats, might, intellect, uh, and speed being fixed stats, each of them are actually a pool uh, of points. So you can just, this is just an example, you could have a 10 might, or you can have a 15 intellect, or a speed of 20. You can use those stat pools to lower the difficulties of tasks that you're performing. So to give you an example, in that example of forcing open a door, that obviously would be a might task. So let's say I have a might of 10. What you can do is you can spend a level of effort. And essentially what that entails is spending three points from the appropriate pool might in this example and it drops the difficulty level down one from a level of three target number nine it becomes difficulty level two target number six same situation you do this before you roll the die you now your target number is six you roll i rolled a two uh, i have failed only if you want to opt into that higher level of complexity do you even have to engage uh, the idea of spending effort? Now, there are a couple of other ways that you can lower difficulty numbers. Uh, the other way that you can lower difficulty numbers is with your skills. So skills in Numenera have two levels, trained and specialized. So if you are trained in a skill, when you're applying that skill to a task, that train skill lowers the difficulty by one. If you're specialized in a skill, that lowers the difficulty by two. So in the example that I was giving, if you have a skill and they do have the skill in the game called breaking inanimate objects, you're just a brute, you're really great at bashing things and breaking things apart, if you were specialized in breaking inanimate objects, in that example of the three uh, difficulty task, it would lower it from difficulty three, target number nine, to difficulty two, target number six, and then difficulty one, target number three. So you would roll, I have a five, 
I'm successful. And the third way, if you wanted to, that you could opt into levels of difficulty beyond just rolling the die and taking what you get are what are called assets. You can only apply two assets to any task. And essentially assets are beneficial factors or tools that you may have that would work in your favor. So for instance, breaking down the door, if you had a crowbar, you could say that that is an asset. And as you probably can imagine, what an asset does is lower the difficulty down by one. So back to the uh, breaking down the door, let's say that again, difficulty three, target number nine, if you are uh, specialized in breaking inanimate objects, that lowers the difficulty down twice. So that brings you from three to one, difficulty one, target number three. And let's say you also have a crowbar. So that takes you from one, difficulty zero. This is the awesome part of Numenera. If the task is ever reduced to difficulty zero, you don't have to roll at all. So cutting down on rolling. Speaking of rolling, since we're talking about task resolution, characters, PCs roll to attack and defend. And Numenera, the game master never rolls. If a PC wants to attack a creature, the PC rolls. If creature attacks a PC, the PC rolls for defense as well. And it's the same thing as rolling to attack. If you were being attacked by a level three NPC, it's a target number nine. And if you were trained in dodging, that would lower it down uh, one level. Difficulty two, target number six. I rolled a 17, I dodged. It took a little bit getting used to, but the main benefit of the GM not having to roll is that it really speeds up play. You may be familiar with the eternal wait that you have to do when you're playing role-playing games. You take your turn and then you have to wait for everybody else in the combat to do their thing. In Numenera, everybody stays engaged because once your turn is over there's a possibility that you can get attacked so you you don't have time to whip out your cell phone because one of the creatures could attack you and you're right back in to the action it really alleviates that eternal weight that you feel with a lot of role-playing games and the other thing that speeds up play in Numenera is the fact that there is no damage troll you roll to hit, and if you hit, you deal an amount of fixed damage based on the weapon or any special ability that you're using. Weapons are really simple. Light weapons do two damage, medium weapons do four damage, and heavy weapons do six damage. You can modify damage by spending effort. If you spend effort from the pool that you are attacking with, either might, speed, or intellect. You can spend three points to do three points of additional damage. Or when you roll a 18, 19, or 20, those are special rolls that do additional damage as well. If you roll a 17, you do one additional point of damage. If you roll an 18, you do two additional points of damage. If you roll a 19, you do three additional points of damage, or you can get a minor effect like the enemy takes a penalty on their next attack, or when you roll a 20, you can do four additional points of damage or some type of major effect on the target. Like you can knock the opponent down or stun them or they lose their entire next turn. And while we're talking about NPCs, the other great thing about Numenera, and which really broke my heart when I group uh, didn't want to play the system any longer, is NPCs were incredibly easy to run. You could make up an NPC in Numenera off the top of your head 
in literally 10 seconds because pretty much the only thing that you have to determine about an NPC is its level. If I wanted a level five NPC, that determines almost everything about the character. Generally, a level five NPC, that's how much damage it'll inflict on a hit. To hit it or to dodge it, you need a target number 15. 15 would also be the amount of health that NPC has. Its level also will sometimes be the amount of armor that it has. So you can make one determination about an NPC in Numenera and build the entire NPC. So easy to use, so intuitive, really heartbreaking because uh, my, my former group didn't want to play the system. And I guess what I'll do now is I will talk about, since we're talking about attacking and we are in the area of task resolution, the other thing that I wanted to mention about the stat pools, uh, might, speed, and intellect, which was a little bit controversial, at least for one of the players in my group. Not only do your stat pools act as ways for you to reduce the difficulty level of tasks, but they also act as your hit points. In my previous example when I said, hey, how about if your character had 10 might, 15 uh, speed, and 20 intellect. When a character gets attacked, when a, when a PC at least uh, gets attacked, the damage comes from their stat pools. The damage first reduces the PC's might then it reduces the PC's speed, then it reduces the PC's intellect. Uh, at least the majority of attacks will attack a character's might first. Attacks that slow the character down would reduce the character's speed, which is uh, very uh, flavorful for me. And whenever a pool reaches zero, the character goes up a damage track. When a character's pool reaches zero, they first become impaired, which means that all of their expenditures of effort increase in expense by plus one. Then if a second pool reaches zero, the character becomes debilitated, which means the character may not take any actions other than to move a debilitated character cannot take any actions other than to move, usually a crawl, and if the character's speed pool is zero, they can't move at all. If a character takes enough damage to reduce a stat pool, another stat pool to zero, he is dead. That was a fairly, for at least one player in my group, was a fairly controversial mechanic where one of the ways you lower difficulties other than skills and assets was by spending pools. Now, I would like to note that the player who had the issue with spending stat points to reduce difficulties and those stat pools also being your, your hit points essentially, played my game <clears throat> for 16 weeks. I ran Numenera for 16 weeks. And that player was not knocked out of a single combat in 16 weeks of play. So though some players may look at um, your stat pools having the dual purpose of being hit points and reducing difficulties, it clearly can be mitigated. I want to talk about character creation and I'll be able to wrap up. Like everything else about Numenera, there is variety and there is enough depth, I think, to keep rules medium players happy. The central process is to build a sentence that describes your character. And that sentence is your character's name is a adjective noun who verbs and your character's name you know what that is the adjective 
is a descriptor that gives your character some abilities and also gives the character a connection to the party. Just to give you an idea of what some of those descriptors are, your character can be charming, clever, graceful, intelligent, learned, mystical, or mechanical. Uh, that would depend on which way you wanted to, to go with that. Rugged, stealthy, strong, strong-willed, swift, or tough. First part of the sentence would be, for instance, if your character's name was Axel. Axel is a graceful noun who verbs. The descriptor gives you some abilities, maybe some increases to stat pools based on the descriptor. For instance, charming gives you a plus two intellect and gives you a skill that you are trained in using abilities that control other individuals' uh, minds. Some of the descriptors also give you an inability. For instance, for charming, you were never good at studying or retaining facts. The difficulty of any task involving lore, knowledge, or understanding, those difficulties are increased by one. Gives you an example of what some of the descriptors are like. And then the descriptor also gives your character a link to the starting adventure. I always have loved games that just normal course of making your character gives your character really easy options to give them depth and background and fit them into the world without the player having to make up all of that information themselves. Of course, if a character, if a player is that type of player, they're more than welcome to make up their character's background or how they're connected to the world or the party. But if they are not that type of player and you are a GM who would like a little bit more depth to the characters, just as part of character creation, the player can go down the list and suss out his background. So. His link to the uh, first adventure of the game for the charming character is either you convinced one of the other PCs to tell you what he was doing, or you instigated the whole thing and convinced the others to join you, or there is reward involved and you need money. The, dis the adjective part of the sentence is your descriptor and it gives you your connection to the group, some abilities, some skills, maybe some increases to your stat pool. Now, the noun part of that sentence, Axel is a charming noun, is basically your type. Now, type you can think of as a character class or maybe an archetype because it's not as, I don't want to say character class because as you will see, in Numenera, you can make a really smart character who is good with a sword and has a lot of toughness where in other games when you say character class a lot of folks will think oh it locks you if you're a magic user then that means you have to be weak and feeble and all you, you can never use a sword and all you can do is cast fireballs well that's not the case uh, with Numenera with Numenera you're the noun part of the sentence the type is kind of an overarching archetype and there are three types in the in the game glaives who are your fighter types nanos who are your magic user types and jacks who are your rogue types and what your type gives you is it tells you what type of armor you can wear it tells you what type of weapons you can use it gives you your starting equipment it gives you some skills and it also allows you to figure out your character's background. So they have a neat little uh, chart here. You roll a d20 and you can take one of these backgrounds. For instance, as a glaive, if you were to roll an 8, uh, you were conscripted into military service, but you deserted before long. Again, 
for players who don't like coming up with backgrounds. Numenera gives you an easy way to, to come up with a background to give your character a little more depth, and I love that. And as you can imagine, for the character type, the glaives are good with all weapons and can wear any armor, and their abilities lend themselves to being a fighter. The nano has abilities that allow them to cast what seem to be spells, but actually what they're doing is controlling nanites and in, invisible nanites floating through the air, or actually controlling technology. They're not actually casting spells. And the jack can be a mixture of both. They, you know, they're your rogues, they're your rangers, they can be good at fighting and, and sneaky and so forth, and have abilities that fall into that area. The last part of the sentence is your focus. So I'll say that Axel is a charming glaive, so fighter type, who, and what your, what your focus is, is what makes your character unique. So the focus gives you your skills, may give you some inabilities, may give you some equipment, and also can give you a connection to another PC in the group. Say that Axel is a charming glaive who exists partially out of phase. So exists partially out of phase. You have the ability to change your physical state. In fact, you're always slightly out of phase, giving you a ghostly translucence. With concentration, you can pass your hand through solid objects and so forth. And the connection that a character who, who um, selects exists partially out of phase, pick one other PC. You have known that character for a while, and he helped you gain control of your phase states. Some of the other focuses that you can choose for your character is bears a halo of fire, carries a quiver, commands mental powers, entertains, explores dark places, focuses mind over matter, fuses flesh and steel, howls at the moon, rages, rides the lightning, talks to machines, wields power with precision, wields two weapons at once. So all of these foci give you special abilities and helps you to further customize your character. At every step of this sentence, adjective, noun, who, verbs, you get your abilities, skills, you get equipment, but you also get background, connection to the first adventure, and a connection to another character in the group, all as part of character creation. And as you can see, my character is fairly varied. I'm a charming character, so I'm good at talking to people, but I'm a fighter, and I have the ability to phase through solid objects. When I first came across Numenera, this is one of the other things that just really, really rocked my world because finally it was a game that connected mechanics to background and role playing and connection with the group and gave you variety. Just because I'm a fighter doesn't mean that I can't read or I can't cast spells. Or just because I'm a rogue doesn't mean that I can't be tough. You can build the character that you want and I've always loved that about Numenera. And I guess the last thing that I want to discuss briefly are experience points in Numenera and what they call GM intrusions because they're they're very much linked. Now you gain experience points in Numenera surprisingly from discovering Numenera and going out and exploring. You can also gain experience points from what are called GM intrusions. Now this is a mechanic that ties up the Game Master's time, so that's why I think it's a good thing that the uh, Game Master doesn't have to roll because one of the GM's tasks is to come up with GM intrusion. So essentially what a GM intrusion is, I'll read it out of the book. At any time the Game Master can introduce an unexpected complication for a character. When he intrudes in this manner, 
he must give the character to experience points. Now, one of the experience points is uh, is for the PC who is suffering the GM intrusion, and then he takes the other experience points and gives it to another player, but he has to justify the reason he's giving it to the other player. Maybe the other player, he says, hey, you made a really great joke earlier, or you're doing a really great job at helping us out, or you had a great idea earlier, and he gives them the experience point. Now, essentially what a GM intrusion is, is, as it said, kind of a complication of the uh, PC's life. For instance, if he tries to quick draw his weapon, the GM can say, ah, GM intrusion, uh, you were trying to pull out your weapon so quickly, it flew out of your hand across the room, or, you know, as you're running up a slippery slope, you slip and start to slide down the slope back towards the bad guys. It's a GM intrusion. The other way that you can get a GM intrusion where the GM can try to complicate your life is if you roll a one on a task, the GM gets to do a GM intrusion, but you don't get any experience points for it. And experience points themselves can be used to advance your character, of course, but they can also be used as kind of action points. So you can spend experience points during the game to get re-rolls, or you can spend an experience points to refuse uh, a GM intrusion, and then all of the other uh, benefits pretty much are advancing your character. That is Numenera, and I think it's time for my Ivan Mike protocol where I tell you how I feel today about Numenera because I don't want anyone to go out and pick up the game and be disappointed. The game is only three years old so as you probably can imagine it's it's really fresh, it's really close to what my preferences are today and I think Numenera and I will also show you the Cypher system also by Monty, Monty Cook Games. Essentially, the Cypher system is the rule system that Numenera is powered by. They came out with a game called The Strange, which was based on uh, the Cypher system rules. Very similar, but a different setting from Numenera. And then they came out with the Cypher system, which is a generic setting, uh, a generic rules book where you can do anything. You can do horror, you can do supers, you can do other science fiction settings. I love the Cypher system, even if you may not like the Numenera setting. Um, and I realize that there are some people out there who have a hard time getting into the, um, the billion years in the future and so forth. But I highly recommend the Cypher system overall, even if you don't particularly like Numenera. Numenera, what I say, it's the system so good, it convinced me to stop role-playing. And <laughs> I, I'm only, um, I guess, 25% joking. It really did uh, hit my sweet spot in every conceivable way. I really can't think of a system that's in my top 10 list that today hits everything that I want it to hit. And it is, in my mind the least flawed game in my in my top 10. I really love it. I would recommend that if you're looking for a, a rules medium system or a rules light system that would allow other players to dabble in rules medium level uh, complexity, Numenera is amazing. I highly recommend it. And thank you for joining me for another episode of Confessions of a frustrated game master. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Thanks.